Call of the Wild's been made into a feature film numerous times. I think the last time was in the 70s with Charlton Heston. All the past iterations of the cinematic telling of this story involved trained dogs and all the limitations of how much you can and can't get out of them. Come here, boy! Come here, boy! Come here, boy! Given that new technology that's now at our disposal, it's the perfect time to do this great American story justice and tell it in a way that five years ago was impossible. And action! No movie that has ever been done has ever attempted to do the entire book. This is the first time the book from beginning to end has ever been attempted. And one of the reasons we're able to actually attempt that is that now we can animate all the animal characters. We could go. I have seen some of the versions, and there's not necessarily a lot of buck in those versions. And it's easy to see why. It's not really a very easy story to tell, because there's a lot of nuance with these animals. But now, live action actors give us the ability to use animation systems to have the animals act on cue. Back. Move! We are able to even go beyond that to giving these characters a real character. <laughs> I don't think he's gonna move. We can direct these characters like you would direct any other actor. You start yeah, on the ground and pop up. That ability, um, <laughs> there's Buck now. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that was unique. We originally started building dogs and pretty quickly we realized that though they looked good, they just didn't seem 100% believable. At that point, we went out and started casting dogs. We started having open auditions for people to bring in their dogs, and we started picking out dogs that we would actually send in for scanning. Once they were scanned, we could go back in and do all the rigging that we would normally do, but we would have a real solid look for them, a believable look. The idea behind this whole thing is that, per the story, dogs were begged, borrowed, stolen. And so you ended up with this real hodgepodge of dogs. And if you look at some of the photographs of sled teams from that time period, they really are a strange collection of dogs. You'll see Great Danes and you'll see Shepherds and all sorts of things. We even had a Bernese Mountain Dog come on set for lighting reference. Buck. The motion capture we're doing with the five dogs yesterday and today is because at this point we're really building a motion library. Animating quadrupeds is not surprisingly twice as involved as animating bipeds. So even simple walk cycles and run cycles for dogs, it's a lot of work to get a believable run cycle. And that's one of the things that we get sort of free of charge out of the motion capture. All the generic motion that is really hard to do believably through traditional animation means. These motion capture sessions will, in the initial phase, begin to create dog and wolf motion that we will use both in previs and it will also carry over into final animation. We start out with some basics, just standing, sitting, moving around in the space so that they can capture the motions of the dog. Then we do intricate things like pulling a sled or digging or putting on their booties. They get to have a really good time. So just like a dog digs in the backyard, we bridge that into a behavior. So you can just see by the way they're wagging their tail, having a blast, jumping for a toy. We get to be closer to them in motion capture so we can play with them. We can use fun things to make the behavior a really enjoyable time for them. Some particular dogs, when they are even barking excitedly, look really mean. That's kind of what we've done for the Spitz characters. We take a Malinois, which has a pretty big toothy bark that looks to the unknowing eye maybe really mean. <coughs> and then we use that toy to sort of get that big bark and then let him have it and play with it, and that's his reward. And so that's how we kind of make the fun, exciting thing look really mean and scary. <coughs> The 
the life of a shot on a movie like this at the level of reality that we're dealing with is a year. From the moment that we think of it to the moment that it is something that we can put into a movie, it's 12 to 16 months. We start with a storyboard. Chris storyboards his own material, so he's able to construct these really complex shots with a high level of clarity. So we take that shot and we give it to our previous team. And our previous team will build a environment, and in this case of Buck running through the corridor, the previous team will work with the art department. They'll figure out the dimensions of what kind of ship it is and how wide is the corridor and what other sort of set dressing and props may be along the way which leads to a certain staircase, to a certain door, to a certain bow. All these things have to be founded in reality and pointed to a historical reference of some type of ship. NPC will then take that shot and they will start to map out Buck's path in a more anatomical, correct manner. Exactly how a dog runs, exactly how a dog turns, how fast they're moving, all the physics are correct based on motion capture, based on reference, and based on just creative animating. Then we will light a full virtual scene as though it were a real set. So we are gonna have our DP involved in that. Our DP will be working with our digital artists and setting up the digital lights, but all of this will be done virtually. Then it goes through rendering and applying the fur and simming the fur to buck. And those things can take 40 and 50 hours per frame just to take all that information and put it into the oven and it comes out on the other end. And then do some fine tuning, then the shot's complete that whole process is a year plus of work. <laughs> yes. Playback on uh, Chris's horror. Yeah, let's take a look. We began the movie with an animated dog and the design was based on a Bernese mountain dog. The thing is, the dog described in Call of the Wild is a very, very specific dog. It's half St. Bernard and half Shepherd. So we couldn't help but notice that the Bernese mountain dog was not that dog. So, well, the funny thing is, is I didn't start out wanting to, you know, find the star of the film. I see a dog that's listed as a cross between like a Scotch Collie and a St. Bernard. And the kicker was that the shelter had named him Buckley. We met Buck and it was just love at first sight. Drove him right to the set, walked him on set, and everybody immediately responded to him. He was so expressive. And so the minute the animator saw him, they're like, we could totally work with this. And he is the identical dog in the movie. This is a classic story that we now have more tools than ever that are gonna let us be able to get that story to the screen for the very first time, the way it was really meant to be seen. We're fortunate enough to take advantage of all the technology and capability of the modern filmmaking process, where we have total control over these characters and their performance and action, and that's phenomenal. We've got live action actors, we've got all that energy and magic that that brings in, and we have all the best of an animated character as well. So we're able to go into these more lyrical, grand sequences that really do fulfill the promise of the book. And when we're able to step away from the human world and just get completely into the animal world for a couple different bits, like when Buck becomes a sled dog, when he ultimately meets wolves, all these things we're able to do with animation as the acting. And it's powerful. Thank you.